Hey y'all, David, and just another quick intro to a sermon that was only 40 minutes. When I do 40 minutes, it feels like it just went by way too quick. But anyway, really fast pace. Um, I kind of wish I would have let things sit and simmer before just like bam, 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 going on to points. So I apologize for that. But the Lord really worked in our midst last night uh, through the whole service and the worship and the prayer time. Um, in the teaching and I believe it really brought amazing healing to a bunch of hearts. Um, sometimes I think we get stuck in these ruts of trying to gloss over our issues um, that cause woundedness, that cause unholy addictions. We tend to gloss over those. We suppress sin, we suppress addiction, we suppress trauma that gave birth to sin or we suppress just trauma that's caused great woundedness and we've got some bad theological reasons for why we hold on to these things and keep them inside while at the same time like we've separated our spirit from our body and say like well Jesus mystically sees my spirit is clean while inside I'm hurt I'm wounded I'm addicted to all kinds of things and so you have these outward freedoms but inside we're still slaves to sin but we say grace grace I would submit that's not a hopeful message at all um, and so the hope of the gospel has changed, David Wilkerson used to say, because he saw the ones that were strung out on heroin. That's where Teen Challenge started. And so, you, you know, you go to a heroin addict who wants to change and wants freedom from these things. And you start preaching some of the things that people are preaching now of Jesus as the great cover-upper instead of the great deliverer. And so, I mean, the hope of the gospel to a heroin addict is changed. The hope of the gospel to this trauma, to these addictions, is the promise from the angel's proclamation when he announced Jesus' birth. He has come to save us from our sins. He's come to save us even from the emotional attachment of things. And so that's what I get into in this message. Um, I hope it's not so fast-paced that uh, you're able to find healing and vision for a hope and a future, a hopeful future where there's real healing for even the things that we didn't think that the Lord could put his finger on. So I just invite you into the miracle of growing in the love and delight of the Lord. I'll see you guys later. Enjoy the message if you listen to it. All right, bye. Lord, I love you so much. You're so beautiful and amazing. Thank you for the direction that you're taking us, drawing us closer into your heart, drawing us closer into those of us who are your body here on earth. Lord, we love your body. We love your face. I ask you to anoint my thoughts, my tongue, my spirit, my body. In the name of Jesus, we ask that your word would run swiftly and be glorified, that all things would be tested through your beautiful word, Lord. We love you. We love you. Amen. Um, today, I'm still kind of focused in the uh, reset messages of things. Hey, guys. Um, and so if I say IHOP, KC, reset, how many of you know what I'm talking about already? Most? Well, half and half. Okay. So they're kind of the mothership of the prayer movement just because they're really big and very visible, and we're in relationship with them. And it was interesting how the Lord's having them focus on important issues like the first commandment, like uh, a sensitive spirit, like focusing on community and family. And for the last year and a half, we've been in this same exact thing of just, we're hungry for this and we need this. Lord, how do we do this here? And so when they did the one thing reset, it just made sense to press in this with them as a global family as well. Um, if you want to look at kind of where we're going and some of my thoughts on this, if you haven't, um, those of you that are with, with us in the House of Prayer, on the website, on the media tab is the one thing debrief. It's like a quick 20-minute 20, quick 20 video and then a whole list of notes that were kind of categorized for where we're going and all these focuses. And so this is the next one um, that, that I'm bringing. The first two that I brought was really just a, a focus on keeping your spirit sensitive. And I was when I was driving up to Kansas City, um, the Lord just let me know and shocked me. He's like, my spirit's not as sensitive, sensitive to him as it once was. And he just said to me plainly, Dave, your spirit is not sensitive to me. You're not sensitive to my voice like you were before because of food, like physical food in my mouth. 
And so we taught on Daniel, and then we looked at Amos, at how they let their beds, their couches, and food dole their spirit so that they left the Lord and judgment came in the land. And so we, we looked at that and how physical food affects that. Uh, Elijah touched that a little bit with some other elements in his uh, uh, message on, on the Lord's fast from Isaiah 58. So that was the first thing. The second thing I focused on was keeping a sensitive spirit to actually be able to walk in the first commandment in the way that the Lord has called us into. So this is kind of on the, on the heels of that, but still kind of in theme with some of the stuff that's going on at IHOP. So if you're with us, um, when we were doing the Sermon on the Mount series, that's just on pause. We'll pick that up again at a, a, a later time when we're done kind of with these foundational reset focuses, a, a focus of things. But honestly, like the Sermon on the Mount, that's some family stuff right there. And uh, where we stopped, we were at conflict resolution and, and all that fun stuff. And so, I mean, that's really... A, a great picture of what it looks like to be a family and be a community. So we'll get back into that at some point, but I'm still on the reset of things. And um, today I want to give us a new vision for holiness associated with the Lord's delight over you. So turn with me to Isaiah 62. And in verse 3, I'll just start on verse 4. It says, it will no longer be said of you. And granted, before I read this, I know he's talking to the land and the nation of Israel. But according to Romans, we have been grafted into a Jewish covenant. And so I believe that this cuts both ways. I believe God has end time purposes for the nation of Israel. I also believe since we've been grafted in, this also speaks to us as well. And so... Again, verse 4, it will no longer be said to you forsaken, nor your land, um, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. That's a big rejoicing. Like those of us who are married, how many of you remember your wedding day and the rejoicing in your heart that you had for your spouse is the same way that the Lord is rejoicing over you. Now those two words in verse four, you'll be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. Um, if I say Hephzibah, does anyone already know what I mean and have heard IHOP or Mike Bickle talk about that before? Hephzibah. Okay. It is just the funniest sounding word for my delight is in her. Hephzibah, you'll be called my delight is in you. And so this, this is not my style to take, especially someone else's dream or vision and use it kind of for the foundation of where we're going. But the story I'm about to share is a big part of who and what the prayer movement is where we're going. Mike shared it at one thing, and it's something he shares a, a lot, but I, I'm using it because I think it does point to scriptural principles that we're going to look at tonight. And so he had, I can't remember if he said it was a dream or a vision. I guess it doesn't really matter for, for our purposes, but uh, he had this dream where he was in a big room and he was declaring Hephzibah over this room. What does Hephzibah mean? Yes, my delight is in her. So he was declaring the Lord's delight over this room full of people. And the power of the Lord came in such a way that the promise was, I will heal and restore the emotional chemistry of the people in this room or the people in this generation when that declaration of the Lord's delight is made over them. So I'm really, really excited for tonight because I think the Lord is going to heal two things, addiction and trauma. Because both those are tied to a faulty emotional chemistry that have been set up through wrong patterns. And uh, by, by that, I, I believe that the Lord shows up with his hand to heal and bam, there it is. And, and the work is done. But a lot of times what we miss, especially in charismatic communities, is we miss the open doors to walk into things. And so that's where the teaching and some of these principles actually come in to help us. Like, yes, 
I want that. I want the renewed emotional chemistry. So bigger than a, just a prophetic moment of just saying, the Lord delights in you, and then like this, uh, this automatic thing. Like I want to show you the open door and how we can walk into it and its association even with the first commandment and, uh, and, and connect those dots. Um, so it's bigger, bigger than a just receive this. This is a press in, dig in, sensitize your spirit, and go after this for real. Because we do have a part to play. It doesn't diminish his part, but I like Corey Russell's phrase of God does not dance with mannequins. You're a bride, and he wants a dancing partner that's going to move back and forth with him. And so when I get into things like holiness, some people's reaction is like, well, no one's perfect. And we use the excuses of no one's perfect to not pursue perfection, which is a biblical New Testament call to pursue holiness, without which we won't see the Lord. We're more scared of legalism, our ideas of legalism in the Western church, than we are that scripture in Hebrews. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which we won't see the Lord kind of like wash that away and we're just so scared of being legalistic one of the things i was blessed to see in israel was real legalism (laughs) not this stuff we make it about in the west and and here's what i mean remember paul's uh, critique of israel's response to the law it said they pursued it as though it were by works at the end of romans chapter 9 they pursued it as though it were by works. God revealed at the end of Deuteronomy, he was after the heart the whole time. Come and let me circumcise your heart so that you can love me. And so the Lord was after the heart even in the law. And what made the law imperfect was their fleshly response to it and keeping the letter of it. And, and so I saw the perfect example when we would go to restaurants and places that serve food. Um, there would be a cup with the chain on it so no one would run off with the cup. There would be a cup in the sink basin so you have just a normal sink and a faucet but there's a cup there and we asked one of the waiters because i just thought it was an interesting thing is this a cultural thing like what is this and i've read the law a bunch because i love the law the law of the lord is beautiful it restores the soul and enlightens the eyes psalm 19 and but i asked the guy like what is the cup in the sink for And he's like oh well it's in the law that before you eat you have to wash your hands with the cup And my mind was blown because like what we call legalism in the West and in America and Europe and stuff is just a totally different thing than what it actually is and what the Lord actually means. But I think when we use the term legalism, we're there. They're like, if you wash your hands in the sink with soap, you haven't fulfilled the spirit of it unless you really actually wash it with a cup. It's like, well, they didn't have plumbing and sinks back then. So of course you had to wash your hands with a cup. Now all these thousands of years later, they're still washing their hands with cups. It was just a funny, funny thing that, that got to me. But uh, anyway, don't hear this tonight as like a just receive it. Or when I say the Lord's going to heal emotional chemistry through uh, either trauma or addiction, don't just say, don't get into this just receive mode. Get into a press in and lean in. And I want this, God. And let it be a lifestyle, a day by day lifestyle that you grow in. So the, the declaration of delight and the promise to heal, the emotional chemistry, these were the two things that were declared over this room in Mike's dream, was the declaration of delight and associated with the delight was the promise of I will heal the emotional chemistry. Now again, beyond a prophetic act alone, we must see the door that this is for us to walk through as we focus on biblical principles of healing this declaration and promise point to and so I, I want to talk about just like emotional chemistry and so can I get a little bit sciency I learned this actually from the Concord series and it's one of the best video series and, and curriculums I've seen out there that helps men get delivered from deep seated lust and pornography and sexual addiction and we've been through the series a few times with a couple different groups um, here in our midst and uh, I, there's another group starting up now and uh, Glenn is hosting it for us at his home he started last last night or two nights ago Um, and so it's something that we want constantly in the in the culture but this is where I I got this understanding from and and reading into it a little bit more and so you've heard the terms left brain and right brain I'm gonna bring that up again but really what we're talking about when we bring those terms up is your prefrontal cortex which is just this small part of your brain that's at, at the front 
Then you've got the limbic system, which is this bigger part back here. That's your emotional side of the brain as well. So you've got higher reasoning, and then you've got all your emotional connections. Now, um, in the emotional aspects of your brain, you have this chemical called dopamine. And so dopamine is supposed to associate great pleasure and great fear and attach you emotionally to things to say, to assign categories like, this is really good, I like this, let's keep doing this. This is really bad, so if you get scared, it'll attach an emotional fear to it to say, stay away from things like this. So stay away from heights, stay away from snakes, stay away from grizzly bears, <laughs> that, <laughs> that type of stuff. Um, or it will, again, attach you emotionally to things that you find pleasure in. And that's what the dopamine is for. This is a, the, the dopamine is neutral in, it, in and of itself. It can be used for great good. It can be used for great bad to really destroy your mind. And so it's released in the emotional attachment of your brain. And it attaches us to the highs and the lows. And this, the emotional section of the brain, this is where the root of all addiction lies and the emotional part, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's pornography, whether it's food, whether it's shopping, video games, TV, all those things when you engage in them, food and sex are the highest. But all those things when you engage in them, there's this shot of this chemical in your brain that's like, ooh, this is good, remember this. And it begins to attach your emotions to it. And so when you do the same things over and over again in your brain, your neurons are connecting together and making a path. So if you have woundedness that leads you into pornography and your buttons are pushed, you get a rejection button pushed or some button gets pushed, and when that button's pushed for years, you've gone down the path to go look up porn, it becomes second nature to you. So much that even if you're not thinking about it on purpose, this button gets pushed and this pathway immediately directs you and to where you've laid your habits. So you've seen a big overgrown field and where people uh, walk over time becomes beaten down. And so there's this path of least resistance to go through the field. And so that's what these neurological connections do is the dopamine begins to um, come in and attach you emotionally to something. And so it's all this dopamine overdo overdose that destroys the emotional chemistry of your brain. And this is why Paul said that sexual sin is a sin against the body. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 6.18? That when you sin sexually, you're sinning against your body because you're actually causing physical damage in your brain. And so when you engage in things that give a high dopamine release, something higher than shopping so again the food and the sex would be like the highest ones when you continually give yourself to those things and you overdose on dopamine the brain scan of a porn addict and a drug addict strung out on coke and heroin looks very much similar because you've destroyed a lot of places in, in your brains it's funny we took uh, the young men through this and I had my sons and some of the the youth guys after we watched that video where they showed the brain scans and I asked them at that one, I'm like, what's your biggest takeaway from that video? And they said, we don't want holes in our brains. <laughs> and so this is good to get our young men started on this because not till the age of 25, your higher reasoning and prefrontal cortex is actually fully developed. So for 25 years, we're actually living out of the emotional part of our brain and dependent on those dopamine releases instead of our higher reasoning. And so... We train ourselves by the addictions that we set, even at a young age. Some of you know my testimony. Before kindergarten, I was addicted to porn and lust growing up in Florida. I didn't know exactly what I was looking at, but I'd go to the beach or the pool or, or see magazines or advertisements, and I just knew what I liked, and I knew what was pretty. And I was addicted to perversion even before kindergarten. The devil starts young, and I grew up in a good, word of faith, Christian home. Anyway. He starts young, and so we're, we're not afraid to speak plainly to our young men and our young women to show them the, the danger and the hope of what they have before them. And uh, I, I love John Wesley's um, articulation on, don't shrink back when I say it, on, on Christian perfection, because he, uh, he would concede that 
we're not free from mistakes. We don't grow up and become perfect in knowledge, so therefore we're always going to have some capacity to err and make mistakes. We're also not free from things like temptation. There's some other stuff. I'm not going to preach his whole sermon on that, but we're also not free from temptation. When Ali and I went to Hebron, it's in the West Bank of Israel, and this is probably one of the greatest examples that I can share to talk about how we actually do warfare because there's not this big battle and then it's over the enemy's a jerk and there's going to be temptation continue to arise no matter how much victory you've had within a season and so when we went to hebron it's in the west bank arab controlled but there's pockets where they have the jewish settlements and what they have in the jewish settlements where the arabs are not is idf is stationed everywhere so there's no active conflict but they are ready to fight when they need to so as we press on into perfection and into maturity, into holiness, again, it's not we have the battles been fought and then we wash our hands and we're done. Like, great, thank the Lord that season's over. But we station our guards with all sobriety and seriousness to be on alert to combat the darkness that would come and try to steal you and rob you of a sensitive spirit towards the Lord. I believe that's really all he wants to do. This is the deceitfulness of sin. This is the deceitfulness of worthless things, Psalm 101. The enemy just wants to distract you so that your spirit becomes dull and you don't know him. And then you're relying on theological principles to bolster your comfort when there's no relationship. So anyway, <laughs> I think I got way off track, but again, this is... The, the dopamine stuff and the emotional part of the brain, this is why Paul says sexual sin is a sin against the body. You actually change the emotional chemistry of your mind for the worst. And this is also why the call of Ephesians 4.23 is most important, to renew your mind. It's what it means to put on Christ, to clothe yourself with Christ, is to renew your mind according to his word. Wash it with water, as Hebrews puts it. You've been given access by the blood. The blood gives us the access and is the entry point. Now you come in and have your conscience clean by pure water. So how, how do we do that? How do we restore the damage that addiction or trauma has done? By destroying the emotional chemistry of our brain. And so I, I want to turn to Deuteronomy 6. And uh, we were here last time I was up before I left for Israel when we looked at the Shema. And uh, I already said Christian perfection, but this is the summit of Christian perfection. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And I'll stop there. This just quoted three times in the New Testament as being the first commandment. And uh, the last session, we zoomed in specifically on this. Distinguish between the puzzle pieces so that we could put the puzzle together in, in right order. Uh, for the sake of those who weren't here for that one, I'm just going to go through this ever so quickly. But the healing of the emotional chemistry and the delight in the Lord is actually tied to this commandment. And so if you remember, uh, those of you who are here in verse 4 in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is what we call the encounter verse. Verse 5 is the actual command that is really the fruit of verse 4. So if we get the encounter of verse 4 going, the natural fruit and the natural response out of you will be to love him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the reason we have so much unbelief regarding verse 5 and that like no one can do that because no one's perfect is because we bypass verse 4 because it, it's a funny thing to us. We don't know what that means. Um, so again, we broke this down. You have the word here is the call to hear. And so it begins with prioritizing a sensitive spirit to the Lord so that your spiritual ears are open. Your ears are circumcised. Your heart is circumcised, which is a sign of the new covenant. And you're able to hear. The O oh, Israel, again, is not a matter of fact like, oh, I almost forgot you, Israel. It's the deep, eternal longing and groaning of God's heart. The word O oh, is an entreaty, meaning I beg you. So think of the humility of the eternal God to come in the flesh and deliver an I beg you to his creation. 
Not I'm forcing my will upon you to make you do what I want you to do. But no, I'm a good husband. I'm a kind husband. I want love to be love and I want it to be a response. So I'm coming down. I'm humbling myself and giving you an entreaty of, oh, Israel, I beg you, prioritize hearing above all else. Um, when that is established and you begin to feel his delight is the next part of the verse. The Lord is our God is the confidence that arises when you begin to realize the personal explosion of fire, light, virtue, and love actually delights in you. Not out of legal obligation or just tolerating you, but he actually delights in you. There's a confidence that comes to press on into the next encounter. The Lord is one, which I believe is the invitation into the depths of the knowledge of God, beginning with the unity of who he is. And so that, just real quick, was a summation of of the last session. And so again, how do we renew our emotional chemistry? It's all in the O. It's all in that impact of delight and desire of his jealousy washing you. It's the first encounter of the great commandment. The impact of his delight The encounter with his goodness and pleasures forevermore releases the pleasure chemicals of our own brains. So we actually begin to get saved from unhealthy emotional attachments as even just a relationship with the Lord will release physical dopamine in your physical real mind. And now you're emotionally attached to the Lord instead of that thing. So that's why I'm inviting you, grow in this thing. Don't wait for him to zap you, but have vision to grow and lay a new pathway and get an emotional attachment to him. I mean, how many of you, when you dated your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever, husband or or something, or or have a kid or or like the thing's new or kids, you've got that new toy or whatever, there's just an infatuation with this person. Remember, Allie and I are high school sweethearts. We just had our 16 year wedding anniversary. And um, we, I remember thinking like, man, my whole thought life is consumed with her. Every time I talk to my friends, it's always about my new girlfriend. All my strength and energy was spent being with her, planning to be with her, or writing a letter <laughs> to her, just or buying something from her. Just I, I was completely consumed with her. Like, this is God's seat. And people wear out. I love my wife, but this is God's seat. And he can sit there And he can forever fulfill you and increase you in love. He is eternal. And this is good news. This is great news. So when we prioritize a sensitive spirit, lean in to hear him, he washes us with delight. So again, our responsibility is the sensitive spirit, lean in to hear. The rest of the encounter of Deuteronomy 6.4 begins to just go and take care of itself. It's so beautiful the way he set it up. And then again, we develop a holy emotional attachment to God, make new neurological connections to God, which brings great healing for our minds as they're washed according to his word. This is why I'm such a big believer in our relationship with the Lord, whether you're an academic guy, whether you're like, I just wanna feel his presence in worship, both of those isolated are not good enough. The Lord has created the left brain, he's created the right brain, in our experience with scripture and our experience with prayer and him should combine right and left brain activities. This is why I think the devil has been at war in the creative arts and stole the creative arts from the church. We actually used to be really good at it. Painting, music, the things that pull in the creativity and the words and the things that pull in the academic realm and combine them So that when we make it a right and left brain experience, we can grow in our understanding, we can grow in our knowledge, and then we can feel it. I believe this is the Lord's design, and this is why I love the house of prayer, because we can grow in our knowledge academically, but if our heart doesn't grow as fast as our minds, we lose discernment. Uh, this is one of the reasons, too, I, I just like listening to music behind my, my prayer time because it, it engages both 
the left brain and, and right brain. I, I don't Bible journal, like draw the pictures like you, like you see, but I, I love looking at that stuff because for them, I think that's what the Lord has set up for that type personality to be able to combine scripture into left and right brain experience where they're engaging with the scripture and they're drawing, being able to draw a picture on the Bible page or, or paint a picture. And so I long to see the creative arts be restored back to the church in the context of even the academic realms. Does that make sense? Right brain, left brain. So again, just to sum up so far where we've been, the Lord's delight over us as individuals is a powerful experiential revelation that will set us free from addiction. All addiction. I, I don't care what it is. I, I talk to some guys that are addicted to things that I never was addicted to, and immediately there's like a, well, you don't know what it's like. All addiction is emotional attachment to things that are not God. But God's delight sets us free by healing and resetting even the physical emotional chemistry of our minds to develop a rightful emotional attachment on Jesus. Again, I've said it uh, a little bit ago, but it's an important note that to know that his delight is not a legal obligation or just uh, mere toleration, but it's again a real delight. The O oh, Israel of the first commandment that naturally causes joyful holiness to, to rise up and a holiness that loves God's commands, feels empowered by them, and is greatly excited about the open door that his commands are to encounter with him. Additionally, it, I believe it heals trauma. Even the worst wounds that trauma has brought us that are deep-seated emotional memories brings healing to those areas as well. And this is where true freedom sets in our hearts. True freedom. And, and I say true freedom because some, especially in, in our charismatic circles, some mean by freedom just an outward expression only. Like I'm free to dance while inside I'm still a slave to sin. And we've got really, really bad theological excuses for that. To claim like my spirit's washed and clean while my body and mind are still a slave to sin and I'm always going to be a sinner. No, you're not. <laughs> Grow up. I'd even submit uh, that the world knows this kind of freedom to suppress the conscience for freedom of outward expression. That's the world's kind of freedom. But true freedom of outward worship, I love outward worship and all the different manifestations, it should be an expression of inward freedom from sin and the judgment to come. So that the outward expression is actually the manifestation of the ecstasy of a clear conscience before the Lord. And again, this freedom, I think, comes all at the founda foundational level of just experiencing His delight over you. And so, in, in closing, I want to just look at our responsibility, the practical part of this message. So remember the first commandment to keep your spirit sensitive, lean into here. That's, that's really it, keeping a sensitive spirit and then lean into here. And then I'll add two things, holiness and fasting. I want to talk about those two real briefly feel like I'm just love you Lord I want to talk about those two briefly because we actually get the lines blurred on these a little bit but when we can distinguish them and use them both together they're actually a powerful tool for encounter with the Lord um, holiness uh, when we use the word a lot of people think of this list and here's the things that are good and we do the things that are good Here's the things over here that are bad, and we don't do the things that are bad. And if you do that list really good, then you're holy. If you make a few mistakes, you might be like 70% holy. <laughs> Holiness is an issue of nearness at its most basic level. It's an issue of nearness. Nearness to God. And so God's invisible, and He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So how do you get close in proximity to a God who's invisible and already everywhere? 
you become like him in nature. You become compatible for closer communion. We're all familiar with the, he grows us from glory to glory to glory. That's all that is. It's just growing in your compatibility to be trusted with more of his presence, to be able to handle more of his secrets as the relationship continues to, to build an intimacy and nearness with him. I've said this before, like so many people out here are, are clamoring for the prophetic and want to be prophetic. And we're looking for gimmicks. Come lay hands on me. Give me a double portion of your mantle. I want your anointing. Pray for me. And we're running around all over the place trying to get this stuff. And God's, I think, sometimes just heartbroken, like just looking for friends. Like we're looking for gimmicks and God's looking for friends. There's nothing more prophetic than friendship with the Lord. And if you prioritize your nearness to him, prioritize a sensitive spirit, he tells his friends secrets. And you've had a close friend that shares things on your heart and you don't go blab all of his secrets either, do you? All of their secrets. It's that way when you start getting secrets from the Lord, be very careful with them. It might not be ours to share. It might be ours to pray or just ours because he's longing for someone to feel his heart with. And so, again, the holiness, the big overarching thing, it's an issue of nearness. It's not about a list that we do or don't do. It's about nearness to him. And so as we press in, get close to him, we see him, we become like him. The list that we tend to make it about, especially parents when we try to conform these outward things on our kids, these lists get taken care of when we can focus on the heart issues. And so that's why even when my boys get in trouble, like I, I don't even care to deal so much with outward expressions. I mean, that's we have the law in place to handle some major outward expressions, but at the same time, I wanna provoke them to look at what's going on in their heart and their mind. Why did they make these decisions? Why did they do that? What was, what was the foundation of that kind of fruit? Is that a bad root? Do we need to pull that root out? I, if we address the root, the fruit will take care of itself. And so it's, it's the same thing with holiness. And the, the other aspect to holiness is consecration, just being set apart. And so I have, like, Allie has all these utensils in the kitchen, and she's got some of these big giant salad bowls that could hold a lot of motor oil, really. Like if I go outside and change the oil in my car... Um, you know what I'm talking about. You change the oil and you put one of those big pans underneath to, uh, to change the oil. So when you drain it, all the oil goes into this pan and then you take it to the guy who can dispose of it for you. Well, Allie's got bowls that can contain all that and do that job for me, but I'm not going to change oil with Allie's big salad bowl because her salad bowl has been set apart and consecrated for use in the kitchen. So that's the other aspect of holiness is separating yourself, consecrating yourself, time, energy, resource, to give it to the Lord to build relationship or to be about his business. This is where we blur the lines between fasting and holiness. Is a, a leader will call a fast for a congregation and he's like, fast however you want to, fast Facebook, TV. And so we use, and I still use the terminology too, just because people are familiar with it. So how many of you have ever fasted Facebook? <laughs> Me too, but that's not a fast. That's consecration. You're consecrating yourself. You're setting yourself apart. And now here's the error that we often make in setting ourselves apart is we just set ourselves apart and then we stop at that. But you're set apart unto. So people who fast or consecrate themselves in a greater way during a season and never set themselves unto in greater ways have miserable experiences. <laughs> They're like, where is the Lord? I can tell you with a clean conscience, I enjoy fasting. Well, I'm not saying I haven't had like my stomach hurt because of hunger pangs, but for the most part, it's been a wonderful experience because I know if I'm gonna do without food, I don't know how it works, but it works, you guys. This is real food that fills your belly. And I will spend all day with this and in prayer. And it satisfies even my spirit or my physical hunger many times. And so 
when we set ourselves apart or when we fast, use that time, use that energy, use that resource that you would have spent doing those other things, those lesser things to be before the Lord. And so that, that's really holiness is the nearness issue, becoming like him in nature. And then the consecration, just setting yourself apart. You're holy unto the Lord. That's all it means is you're going to be holy unto the Lord. Like I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to have to say no to some things to do the greater thing. That's going to give eternal rewards, which is going to be nearness to him in the next age. Uh, the other issue of fasting. Everywhere in Scripture, and I talked about this last session with Daniel, everywhere in Scripture fasting is mentioned. It's always in connection with food. We've got so much kind of weird Greek philosophy in the church that we, we've put a big division between heaven and earth or uh, heaven and the physical realm and don't have any grid for how they can really, really intermingle. God might show up in a miracle some way, but we don't mostly see heaven as a physical place and we don't see earth as a place that can actually interact with heaven. In the same way, we've caused divisions within our bodies, soul, mind, and spirit that ought not be there. And it's only there because the church has adopted so much Greek philosophy in her foundations. Um, in the beginning years of the early church that came from Alexandria and a man named Orgent, whose whole mission after he gave his life to Christ was to combine Platonism, Plato, that the philosophies of Plato with Christianity because he believed that Platonism provided the correct foundation for biblical interpretation. And the root of that, the, the, the beginning foundations of Platonism was that divorce between heaven and earth and they cannot mingle the divorce between spirit, soul, and body. So we're in this corrupted body while our spirit is just like perfect and that's not the case. We're more one than we realize and I say that because food will affect your spirit. That's why fasting is so powerful. Daniel was not gifted just like at, at, at a random thing. We talked again last session. Daniel set himself apart and it became his lifestyle to not dull his spiritual senses with his physical appetites. And so again, everywhere the Bible mentions fasting, it's always food. And that's really the only... Uh, the only part of fasting I wanted to hit for our purposes tonight because when we use fasting, saying no to food, to walk in a greater sensitivity of spirit, when we use the consecration thing with the vision to become like him in nature and grow in holiness as we press into here, as we sensitize our spirit, that first encounter he leads us into is the delight. Him washing you with the delight that brings healing to your emotional chemistry that begins to do undo that trauma. Even trauma that has led into addictions begins to pull out roots. And like that big grassy field, the grass begins to grow up in these old paths. And now it becomes easier to, when your buttons are pushed to run to the Lord, to run to scripture, to run to quietness and meditation and, and nearness with him. Again, fasting combined with holiness to access God by the blood of Jesus will set you into the here part, wash you with his delight, and launch you into the first commandment in a fresh way. Let's pray. Um, stand with me. If you're like, God, I need healing. I need emotional healing. I believe Mike's vision that he shared about the declaration of the Lord's delight bringing healing to our emotions because I see it in scripture and I believe it's the Lord's heart and so some of you he might give you something instantaneous tonight but many of us I believe there's just a door standing open and he's saying come up here come up here Lord I love you you are beautiful we thank you that you are so good, that you start this whole thing with delight, that you start it with delight, Father. Any areas of addiction, we just lift those up to you right now and acknowledge we were wrong. At the beginning, when we were making moral decisions that laid an unhealthy foundation, Father, some of us are out of control, and I ask you for grace to begin to walk in freedom from sin. Father, you sent your angel to proclaim the coming of your son. 
And your message to us was he would save us from our sins. Father, save us from the damage of our sins. Save us from the trauma and the damage that the sins of others have caused us. Save us from our sins completely, God. We thank you for the hope that you have set before us, that we can walk with a clean conscience before you, that you can save us to the uttermost. You can save our bodies. You can save our minds. You can save our spirits, complete together, forever and completely. You save us forever and completely. You're amazing. God, I pray for my friends here. I ask you for healing. Heal the damaged minds, the damaged hearts. I ask you to release real freedom, freedom in the spirit over our minds. We thank you for the gift and the promise of holiness. We love you, Lord. Amen.